I'm Steve Stromberg. I'm an editorial writer for The Washington Post. Uh, with me on stage to discuss the relationship between the private sector, consumers, and sustainable business practices, I have Sid Kitson. He's chairman and CEO of Kitson & Partners, a former NFL player who now oversees a 17,000-acre solar town called Babcock Ranch in southwest Florida. Uh, next, we have Sophia Mendelson. She's the head of sustainability at JetBlue Airways. Uh, and lastly, we have, but not least, we have Malcolm Wolf, Senior Vice President for Policy and Government Affairs at Advanced Energy Economy, uh, a DC-based national association of business leaders working to benefit advanced energy companies. Um, and a quick reminder to everybody, you can uh, tweet for our panelists using hashtag world in balance or post them to the comments, your, uh, your, uh, you can post your own comments to the comments on Facebook Live. Uh, I will try to take a few of those uh, throughout our discussion. So, uh, welcome. Um, I think we're entering a period when the government, or at least the federal government, is seems sort of determined to do less to mandate environmentally sound uh, business operations, um, which means it arguably then falls on businesses themselves. Uh, to decide what they owe to society at large as they also seek to make a profit. Um, so why don't we start with a question that sounds pretty basic. Is there such a thing as corporate responsibility, at least outside of seeking profit and satisfying corporate owners? Uh, to what extent are companies responsible to society at large, you know, only to the extent that doing good encourages consumers to continu continue to buy, uh, or beyond that? So whichever one of you wants to start with that really easy question. I think it's a question of time frame. Mm -hmm. So your, your first question is, what is the purpose of us trying to, quote, do good while making a buck? And if it's a quarter to quarter view and you're a short term investor, the argument is arguably harder, mm -hmm. especially if you have a longer ROI. Luckily, most of us are in business for the long run. We've built things. We want to establish reputations. The, the, for, the top uh, Fortune 50 companies, have multiple have been around for 100 years. That's what CEOs envision. So we have the opportunity here to fight short-termism and really sell up the food chain to, the, to boards, to investors, that sustainability is another word for long-term smart investment. And, and what's been your experience at JetBlue? Has it been a struggle to uh, uh, convince you know, your bosses and your boards that this is a, the long-term view is the view they should be taking? We're a publicly listed company, so we have quarter-to-quarter -quarter calls, and I think that answers the question to a certain mm. extent. Um, the more social pressure there is and the more expectations there are for, from consumers to behave in a certain way, the more it helps folks like me make a long-term argument without necessarily waiting for the regulation and needing to re rely on the fear of regulations, uh, carrot and stick. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any question that there's a responsibility to the private sector. And it is good business. And, and it is important to take a long view. Now, that's easy for me to say because I'm a, in, the, in the private sector. Um, when we first uh, 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 took a look at Babcock Ranch, it was a 91,000 acre ranch. That's 143 square miles. And, and we sold 73,000 acres to the state of Florida and Lee County in the largest land purchase in the history of the state. And then we ended up with 18,000 acres. And out of that 18,000 acres, we're preserving half of that. So at the end of the day, 90% of, of the original ranch, Babcock Ranch, is in preservation forever. And that's a legacy that's going to be, uh, that, that people are going to be able to enjoy for generations. And, and we think that's very, very important. And then we ended up with, uh, with this uh, basically 9,000 acres, and we're building a new town, but a very sustainable town. And we think it's good business. So when we looked at, uh, we started planning our new town, we went back 40 years and looked at plans uh, to, to see how the natural flowways through this property kind of worked their way through, and that's how we designed it. And we designed it on, on, on land that is, has already been disturbed. And so when you, when you think about what you can do from the private sector uh, and, and make it profitable, we believe it's, it's, it's great business, mm -hmm. A, but B, it's the right thing to do. 
Um, we have issues that we have to, to address as a society, and, uh, and we think it's our responsibility to do that. So it's very exciting to us, and, and one of the things that uh, we talked about the first solar town, one of our first initiatives was say, how do we deal with the energy? You know, we're going to have almost 20,000 homes and 6 million people. That's, I mean, 6 million square feet of commercial space. Say that's a lot of people. That's, and, uh, and, and, yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's more like a, like a China city. Right, but, right, uh, right. but no, we're, but it's, it's going to be about 50,000 people. But energy was the key for us. So we spent eight, nine, or almost nine years of time. We actually made the announcement here in Washington, D.C. that we were going to become the first solar power town in America. And Florida Power and Light has built a 75 megawatt solar power generating facility right on our property. It's there today. We donated the 440 acres. They've installed 343,000 panels. So when you're at Babcock Ranch today and you look at the, the, uh, the, the light in our town, it's powered by solar energy. And at night, uh, the, uh, it's the uh, 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 natural gas then kicks in and it's powered by natural gas. So the combination of those two make it the cleanest form of energy of anywhere in the, in the um, country. But the next step is storage. So how do we take this to a whole other level? And, and if we can store the energy and not be on the grid, then we've really, really accomplished something. And that's, that's where we're headed towards. But that's good business. And I'll just quick, one quick story. We had a, uh, an event where we said, come see our progress at Babcock Ranch. And because uh, everything was under construction and people wanted to see what was going on there. And uh, we we're hoping a couple thousand people would show up. That's a lot of people, a couple thousand people coming in to see what you're doing. Well, 20,000 people came to see what was going on at Babcock Ranch. And every single person there was asking, we want to see the solar. We want to see what's going mm -hmm. on with the solar. So Florida Power and Light has a, agreed to build an observatory so people can actually see the scale. They of want it. to see the plant they, itself. They wanted to see what yeah. it was all about and how, how it actually worked. And, and, they were very, and, and so Florida Power has put a kiosk in to explain how it works. And then they're going to have an observation tower so people can actually see really what the scale of, uh, of what they're doing. Huh. I think what this, what this conversation has already shown is that sustainability might have been leading edge 20 years ago. It's pretty mainstream today. Yeah. It has been embraced by corporate America. In fact, 71% uh, of Fortune 100 companies have specific numeric uh, renewable or greenhouse gas targets that they've committed to achieve. They're accountable to their board and shareholders to achieve that. When you go to the Fortune 500, it's over 43% and growing. So this is already pretty mainstream with the large companies. I think it's growing down to even the smaller size companies. Agreed. And when you look at the size of the advanced energy industry, the, the, the clean tech industry that powers our economy, it's, this is not a future industry. This is a current big business. Uh, we're two, a $200 billion US industry, over 3 million jobs, roughly the size of retail, uh, and growing five times, excuse me, three times faster than, than the US economy when you don't count ethanol. Mm -hmm. So this is a fast-growing, already existing industry, which just underscores that sustainability is now mainstream in at least corporate America. And just to be clear, the advanced energy economy is? So we're all forms of kind of cutting-edge advanced technology. So it's the renewable guys, wind, solar, energy efficiency, electric vehicles, uh, fast-acting natural gas. Uh, modular nuclear reactors, all the forms of technologies that may not have been competitive 20 years ago, but are competitive and being deployed today. And are you feeling demand for this sort of sustainability from shareholders, boards? I mean, is it across the board, or is there uh, within kind of corporate structures, there are some who seem to be more interested than others? Or can you detect a pattern? Sure. Um, I think there is a pattern. Certainly, uh, the larger companies, more sophisticated companies, a long time ago started this. They were the tip of the spear. Uh, Walmart, for example, announced their sustainability goals, 100% renewable energy commitment in 2005. You know, that was a different administration, a different time. This is not a fad that comes and goes with, with, uh, with the political administration. Mm. This is a long-term commitment. And that has now progressed much beyond kind of those leading companies to be mainstream. And I think there's a few reasons why they do it. Uh, first of all, it's economic now. There's not necessarily a cost. Uh, you can sign wind contracts at two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Solar is coming down below four cents. Energy efficiency utilities are doing it at about four cents. So it's, there's not a price premium you have to pay. You just have to ask the question. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, a real, I think, social value that corporations have. They're part of their communities. They want to sponsor the Little League team. They also want to have a sustainability commitment to show that they're good stewards. 
and increasingly, at least what I'm hearing from our members, is that they're asked about it. They're asked about it by their employees. Millennials want to work for a company that they feel good about, and they're being asked about it by shareholders. Uh, Sophia, you're nodding your head a lot. I, I agree, and, and I think this is a perfect example of what we're really dealing with is the hangover from the reputation that sustainability and environmental social governance used to have. And it's mm. like, 10 years ago, that was true, but it takes a long time for society to move on with a conversation. And so we come to conversations like this and we're still starting it by saying, this is good business. When I go to a finance conversation, we don't start it saying, making money is good business. <laughs> and we should have lots of different people doing it, regardless of the administration. So the, the sooner we put that conversation aside, the better. And I think one of the many ways that that, that change is happening is by having small, medium enterprises begin to take the message to their consumers so it's not just the top brand value, JetBlue, Disney, Coca-Cola, saying we have to do this to protect our reputation with consumers. It's beginning woven into society. Um, on consumers, because I think there's a fascinating question of, of when do they care? When do consumers care? It actually surprised me a little bit when you mentioned the solar interest in solar, because I would have assumed at Babcock Ranch, the real appeal of the sustainability that you, um, uh, uh, you have built in to the development is you have nature around, you have trails, you have sh you know, shining sun and animals and green, right? Um, it surprised me that there would be that much interest in, in the solar generation per se. Um, but, so, 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 but more broadly to all of you, when do consumers care? I mean, do they care whether the Starbucks in their local strip mall has a green roof? You know, well, do they notice that? Do they care that the cups have recycling labels on them? Um, you know, do they care when they are informed that the coffee beans come from a sustainable agricultural practice? You know, are there circumstances in which consumers seem to care more about sustainability? And if so, how do you either cultivate those circumstances mm. uh, or expand the customer's sort of conscientiousness? You know, I, I think they absolutely care. And what's interesting, it's not just uh, the millennials, but it's the baby boomers. I think both really care about where, uh, what we're doing as a society. And, it, and, it, and one thing I, you know, people equate it to, it's first of all, it, cost is a big issue. I mean, we, we really need to think about, you know, the way we term it is better quality at a lower cost. And so money does matter, and what comes out of their pocketbooks do matter. And as much as people want uh, to be sustainable, it still has to make economic sense for them, for them individually. Also, it's proven that if you uh, live in a healthy environment, you're going to live longer. That's, that's absolutely a proven fact. So I think people think about that also. Mm. So when you start to comb uh, put, put all these things uh, t together from a consumer perspective, it's not only accepted right now, but people are seeking it. They're looking for that type of a lifestyle. And from a product perspective, and from our, pers you know, what we're doing uh, from a more of a community perspective. You know, you know, I read a lot about how everybody's talking about building these smart cities, and we're already doing that. All those things that people have talked about, whether, you know, how we talk about the environment, on the education side, we've, we, we started with a school. We, don't have, we didn't have anybody living there, and we started uh, with a school, and it's amazing uh, how that filled up almost, uh, almost instant, instantly. Um, we have the, our, our solar uh, energy. Our transportation is going to be with autonomous vehicles. We actually are starting next month with an autonomous shuttle, electrically powered autonomous shuttle. Mm. So think about this. We have autonomous vehicles that are powered by solar energy, and it's, it's transporting people from point to point. And the whole idea here is, is what we're, we're hoping is people right now basically have two cars in their garage. We think very shortly people are going to be looking at one car in their garage. And then shortly after that, we hope within the next 10 years, they say, wait a minute, we don't need any cars in our garage. And think about the societal benefits and what that does uh, to, to not only for consumers, but, but for our landscapes and, for, and for just for society in general. The societal benefits are absolutely uh, incredible. We're doing that right now at, uh, at Babcock Ranch. And so those sorts of, and, and health and wellness really then ties into everything you were talking about with the right. trails and, and, uh, and, and we have, a, a, you know, occupational therapy and, and physical therapy and, and eating well. Everything is farm to table. Mm -hmm. Those things people really care about. When they come in and they know that our restaurant is farm to table, they talk about it and they come back and they come back and they enjoy it. So that the, 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 those things, the sustainable part of what we're doing 
is selling homes, and it, and it is something that, in our mind, is very economically feasible. Mm -hmm. So you started off by talking about how you know, sort of the obvious point, consumers are cost sensitive, right? Absolutely. Um, at the same time, you seem to be saying that there is sort of a sustainability premium that people are willing to pay. Um, you know, how do you, is, is there, is, is that what you're saying? And is there sort of a, a balance that you have to establish between the two? You know, I, I toured this um, sort of smart solar powered town in um, sort of model city over in, in Japan uh, last year, and everything was gleaming and very efficient and very nice and new, except it was a little expensive. So, I mean, is, is, how, do you, how do you compete against, against sort of the non-sustainable developers? I, I think you have to make it work, have to be economically feasible for the consumer. Yeah. And so I, I think those are very, very important. Again, better quality at a lower cost. So everything we're doing, we look at how, how can this, whether it be autonomous vehicles or, or, or how people are living their lives in their homes, uh, the availability of the trails and, and, and giving people a choice, but we're looking at keeping those prices down. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I don't think just because it's sustainable, just because you're doing it the right way, means it, need, means it needs to be more expensive. Mm -hmm. And we're proving that out. It really doesn't. Even how you build homes. Part of the issue is, is we're greenfield, so we're coming out of the ground right now. I mean, on the technology side, we have a gigabit to every single home, mm. fiber to every single this home is, and uh, business. Inter internet access. Exactly, so when you have that kind of speed, if you're trying to do that in other towns, you're digging up lawns and, and creating all kinds of havoc, and it's very, very expensive. So in a brownfield situation, it might be a little bit more expensive. Yeah, yeah. But in the greenfield, doing these things the right way from the beginning is very important. And if you're in Florida, anybody here from Florida, you'll know that we have 1,000 people a day moving into our state net. We need to accommodate that, and we need to do it in the right way. And so if, if, if you think about doing it the right way from the beginning, those costs aren't nearly as, as uh, onerous as you think they are. Mm. Uh, Malcolm, I think you have something to say. Sure. I, I, going back to your, your earlier question, I yeah. think business is really following demand here. That demand is there, which mm -hmm. is why they're responding. Whether it's Energy Star labels that customers want or lead certified buildings that businesses want to keep their costs down, uh, there's a whole array of market signals that businesses are responding to. And they found that it doesn't cost more, that old concern about a price premium. You know, simply to talk about the, the housing example, orientation of the house. You just frame the house thinking about, hey, how is this going to be sustainable? It doesn't cost more to maybe turn it 15 degrees mm -hmm. to get the kind of community you want. So I think folks are beginning to realize they don't have to choose between price and sustainability. They can get what they want and still be competitive. And if, and if you don't do that, people are going to walk an extra block to go to the organic cleaners or, or the more sustainable coffee shop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your, your second question exposes the weakness of your first question. Your ah. first question being, do they care? And your second question immediately being, but how much are they willing to pay for that? Yeah. Because the answer is universally, when we're done with all the nice stories, not very much more. Mm -hmm. And we sell all kinds of expensive things all the time, like purses to women. I and mean, people pay a lot for things. And it doesn't seem that that luxury premium will necessarily translate to, quote, doing the right thing when you're walking um, to, the, to the cleaners or, or the grocery store. So for big companies, I think it's actually a straw man to ask if consumers care. And we should just be working with our current marketing structure, which is very well established at all of these large companies, and saying, why do people buy our products in the first place? OK, yeah, they want to get some more, because they want to feel good about themselves. They're always going to care about that. That's the basic marketing question. So rather than asking them to care about something esoteric and special and far off and distant that, that they still need to learn about, let's just ask them to care about themselves like they have been the whole time and let me work within the product much like Lisa was saying to change the supply chain so they don't even have to think about it. They just feel good with the brand. Hmm. Uh, I have a question uh, from Savannah on Twitter. Uh, Sophia mentioned that companies will be more likely influenced to be more sustainable when the public expects and demands it. Uh, how can consumers best voice their desire for more sustainable practices within companies? 
Yeah, there are two ways. One is your individual purchasing power, which is now greater than ever um, with the microphone of social media. And, and the other way is as an investor. Um, individuals are the ones behind the banks. It's us saving our money for the long term for our long term goals. Tell your company who, who manages your 401k. Tell your, um, your, your media, excuse me, your, your money managers um, and your mutual funds that you want them to be looking out for your money in the long run, that you didn't put this money away and save it to use tomorrow. It's for in 50 years, so you'd like it to be with a company that can at least think out 50 years. Hmm. Um. Uh, when we think about sustainability, uh, we often think about sort of wind turbines on the horizon or solar farms with an observation deck. Um, but arguably more important is driving efficiency. Um, so what are you trying to use less of in your various spheres and uh, how are you doing it? Who wants to go first? I'm, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at it. Um, uh, as an example, uh, water is, uh, mm. is very precious. And so we, uh, we have our own water treatment facility, but everything in the entire community is, um, is uh, irrigated with reuse water uh, to replenish the aquifers and uh, to make sure that, uh, again, thinking about sustainability in, in the long term. And by reuse water, you mean you collect everything that Absolutely, sort of circuit, comes yeah. back in and yeah. goes and goes right back out. Yeah. Yeah. And but there you are have on-site water treatment to do that. Yes, and, yeah. yes, that we own and we operate yeah. and 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 have uh, and made sure that it's it, it's done in an appropriate way. I think I think some of the other things too are in design. Um, so when you when you pull into Babcock Ranch, you're not going to see a lot of grass. You're going to see natural areas along the the boulevards. Mm. And, and therefore, you don't have all of the, uh, the leaf blowers and the lawn mowers and everything else mm -hmm. constantly burning uh, and, and spending the time mowing those areas. Instead, they're natural. People love it. They go, well, why don't we just always have this? Because they're beautiful areas. And, and the other thing we've done is, is used natural uh, native plant materials. One of the things that down in Florida, uh, we do have wind events every now and then. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so the things that survive are generally native, native plant materials. So, uh, and not only are they native, but they require less water. So, you know, we have uh, committed to making sure that uh, we restrict the amount of turf that people allow on their homes and that uh, and the, and, uh, the majority of all of the, of the landscaping has to be native plant materials. That's just, that's just one example. Mm. And that, that type of thinking from a CEO and decision maker at that level is exactly what we need with the Fortune 500s. And again, it, it goes to long-term versus short-termism. Um, BlackRock has a great statistic where they um, interviewed a couple hundred CFOs and 50% of the CFOs said they would forego investing in a smart project in their supply chain that saved money, saved, saved fuel, et cetera, if it meant they were going to miss quarterly earnings by a penny. Hmm. Wow. That's the pressure that is put upon large public companies, which is allowing small private companies to move in a way that we necessarily can. Hmm. That's interesting. The, the, the cheapest next kilowatt of power is the one that's not needed. So there's all sorts of ways that right. companies, individuals can, can reduce their energy consumption, but you do have that short-term thinking. Um, when, you were, when you go to an LED light bulb, the payback period is a matter of months, but there is that upfront cost. Right. Um, so you've got to kind of get past that. And, uh, and I think increasingly more and more of the market is, and that's driving the systematic change. Um, Malcolm, you've been working with major companies to buy renewable electricity, uh, well, advanced electricity of all types. Um, uh, it might sound strange, but you've also sort of criticized government regulation at times as a barrier to doing this. Um, would you please explain when the government helps and when it hurts sustainability efforts? Sure. Um, advanced Energy Economy has actually created an advanced energy buyers group, large corporate buyers who have their sustainability goals, but they're finding it difficult mm. and far harder than it should be to do so. So for example, if you are a business in North Carolina and you want to lease your roofs for solar, you don't want to get into the solar business, but you want solar panels on your roof, you can't do that. That's illegal. Um, in, in another half of the country, if you want to sign a deal for wind power, 
Um, you're not allowed to. You can only buy what your regulated utility allows you to buy. So I think there are a whole array of areas where regulation has gotten in the way. Mm -hmm. um, we're not asking, the industry is not asking for mandates or subsidies. We may have needed that 20 years ago. We're competitive today. What we want is the market to work. And there are proposals out there now to subsidize uneconomic coal and nuclear plants, right. which we think is a troubling development. There's other proposals to impose tariffs on solar panels, uh, to change the tax code and change uh, the existing uh, phase outs of these subsidies, which is going to disrupt the markets. All we want now is leave us alone, let us compete, mm -hmm. let markets work. Mm -hmm. uh, you've also uh, said that the federal government is sort of deferring to states more often now on sustainability questions, um, but a lot of the, that, that a lot of the states don't really know what to do. Um, uh, as a former state energy official yourself, uh, are there some that are sort of getting it right and others that are getting it wrong, or is there kind of a are we universally at sea here? Um, I think there's a fundamental change that's happening in the electricity world that's going to take some time. But one state that I think is, is doing it well is New York. Mm -hmm. And just to share a, a quick example, in Brooklyn, I understand Brooklyn has become hip and cool again. Millennials are moving in. So it's one area in the Northeast <laughs> where there's load growth. And mm -hmm. to upgrade, upgrade a transformer, which would be needed to meet that growth, would cost north of a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. A billion dollars. So the regulators decided an innovative approach. Rather than simply allow the billion dollar upgrade and charge ratepayers, they challenged the utility to spend 200 million uh, and see if they could solve the problem. And instead of saying, do it by upgrading the substation, they said, find a solution. Go out to the market for solutions. Don't pick a technology. And the market responded between uh, energy efficiency and solar and storage. They're going to be able to solve that problem for 200 million instead of a billion. Mm -hmm. But now look at it from the utility's perspective. Right now, they get a rate of return on how much money they spend. So if they spend a billion dollars, they get a rate of return on that versus 200 million. So New York is trying to change the incentives so that you can incent industry to make money by doing the things that's right for ratepayers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of change, there are a few leading states, Rhode Island, um, Massachusetts, actually Minnesota, Hawaii. There are a number of states that are looking at how do we, how do we evolve the utility business model to get what we want for cheaper. Yeah. You know, it's been interesting. We, we've been very fortunate uh, working with Florida Power and Light in, uh, in Florida. And uh, they've been very progressive in, in thinking about renewable energy uh, and, and how they can further it in the state. I mean, they've really taken a, a lead in building multiple uh, 75 megawatt solar uh, farms throughout the state. And then what's really been interesting, and, and um, you know, not, not everybody wants to hear this necessarily, but they've been challenging us about how they can be more sustainable and how they can get the word, up, word out about every time uh, that, um, that, that uh, they drive their car, what it means and versus if they're solar powered. Hmm. And uh, letting people truly understand what it is we're trying to do and whether it be storage, which is the, you know, hopefully the next level for us uh, at Babcock Ranch, we're very engaged with them to try and take that to a next step. But so there's a there, there's a, a, a large company uh, that is is really looking at sustainability, and they're passionate about it and how they can take that to a whole new level. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Ben on Twitter who asks: uh, Sustainable purchasing options seem mostly readily available for middle and upper classes. How can or do sustainability, sustainability efforts of private industry reach those of lower economic standing with less purchasing power? Yeah. Um, well, Ben, I, I'd say that's a great question that's been solved already, um, that it's Walmart being a perfect example of a very accessible brand and set of goods that have solved this problem or are solving this problem for the consumer so that you don't have to care about it. Just like we don't ask you to care about any other internal workings of the company. Um, and as JetBlue is uh, New York's hometown airline and I'm a young, hip millennial, so I'm, <laughs> I'm glad. In Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, in Brooklyn. So um, I'm, I'm glad to uh, hear that. But it, again, it, it really, um, I'm sorry, the question origin that you originally answering about uh, the kind of states that are that are yes. trying to lead the way yes. in this effort. Thank you. Um, the success stories here are all because this has been depoliticized. Hmm. And it's been depoliticized through common, the common sense of money. 
And so if there's one message for this room, one tone we could take away, that if we leave this in the hands of business, we will be able to handle it logically. Uh, we probably have time for one more question from Twitter here uh, from Isabel. Uh, who asked, Sid, um, was Babcock affected by the recent hurricane? If not, how does the ranch's vulnerability to climate change and weather disasters factor into their operations and sustainability plans? You mentioned this a little bit already, but is, is there any more? That is such a, a great question. So Babcock Ranch is 30 feet above sea level, and, and uh, we're well above the storm surge. Is that a lot? I'm sorry. In, 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 in Florida, that's a virtual mountain. Okay. So, <laughs> and so we're, 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 we're above the storm surge. We didn't build in any wetlands. We're not building any floodplains. And we've hardened the community. So thank you for asking that question because the eye of the hurricane went right over the top of us. And by the way, all of our utilities are buried underground. And everything we do, we think about that, that resilience so that people don't have to leave. They don't have to evacuate if in fact there's a storm uh, in, in Florida. And so we, I think the responsible thing we should be thinking about is where we build. I mean, sometimes, I, and people don't like to hear this, but you know, if we're building in floodplains, uh, if we're building in, in those wetlands and those low-lying areas, and there's a storm, there's gonna be damage, and then we're all gonna have to pay for that. And that's mm -hmm. consistently what happens. What we're doing at Babcock Ranch is a, is a totally different model, where we're well above uh, the, the storm surge, and, and because we're hardening you know, the construction, uh, it's really safe for people. They don't have to worry about you know, jumping in the car and getting out and, making, and, and uh, finding a, a safer area. People are going to be coming to our community to be in a safe area. And there's so many lessons learned uh, that through the uh, Hurricane Irma, um, and, and, uh, and, and we're going to take those lessons and continue to improve. But the eye of the storm came right over the top of us. And I would say within two days later, you would not have known that Babcock Ranch was hit by a hurricane. Well, the National Flood Insurance Program, thanks you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, panelists, that's all the time we have. Thanks for joining us and sharing your expertise. 